Are you looking to improve employee engagement and retention? Do you struggle with decisions on who to hire or who to promote? I have an amazing opportunity for a forward-thinking, purpose-led, people-first organisation to work with me on the first pilot Happier at Work programme for corporates. The programme is entirely science-backed and you will have tangible outcomes in relation to employee engagement, retention, performance and productivity. The programme is aimed at people leaders with responsibility for hiring and promotion decisions. If this sounds like you, please get in touch at Aoife at happieratwork.ie. That's A-O-I-F-E at happieratwork.ie. You're listening to the Happier at Work podcast. I'm your host, Aoife O'Brien. This is the podcast for leaders who put people first. The podcast covers four broad themes, engagement and belonging, performance and productivity, leadership equity, and the future of work. Everything to do with the Happier at Work podcast relates to employee retention. You can find out more at happieratwork.ie. Naturally, when they have built up their confidence that they can do this or whatever, that just opens so many doors for them in terms of their own self-belief and their own confidence and their own capabilities. And, you know, if they say people leave managers, people stay with managers that do that for them. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Happier at Work podcast. My guest today is the lovely Ariel O'Farrell. Now, this is Ariel's second time to be on the podcast, but she's not the first person to come onto the podcast twice. Previously, Andrew Barnes from the Four Day Week Global has been on the podcast twice already. Today, Ariel and I are talking about her latest book, The Manager's Dilemma. This is her third book to be released, and it's the second in a series for performance development for managers. I have read all three of Ariel's books so far, and she has another one. The third in the series of the performance development is coming out at the end of 2022. Now, we cover a lot of ground in this podcast. We started by talking about the book. We kind of went in a roundabout way, taking a bit of a step back and talking about some more general concepts that impact on managers, especially at work, but I think for everyone. And a lot of what we talk about can really be applied to improve people's performance and productivity at work and find a bit of time. If you're feeling like you are a little bit, you know, strapped for time, which I think who isn't, then I think this listening to this episode can really, really help you As always, I will be doing a summary, a synopsis, a synthesis of the key points that were made during this conversation, which I think will be kind of hard to summarise everything that we spoke about, but I will try my best and pull out that key information that you really need to know to take action uh, and not just listen to this podcast, but actually take action as a result of listening to this podcast, which really is what I'm doing it for. If you want to find out more about Ariel, you'll find her details on evolutionconsulting.ie. If you want to get involved in the conversation, please reach out to me on social media. Feel free to like, post, comment, share anything about the podcast. And you will connect with me on my website, happieratwork.ie, Instagram, happieratwork.ie, or through LinkedIn, Aoife O'Brien. Ariel, welcome back to the Happier at Work podcast. You are the second guest who has come on twice onto the podcast. So I'm delighted to have you return and to give us a little bit of an update about what you've been up to and to talk about your new book. So do you want to let people in on, you know, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Yes, thank you, Aoife. It has been a pleasure to, to be called or to be asked back again to your podcast. Um, and always a pleasure talking with you. Um So since we last, I think we last, when I last was on the podcast, we were talking about my book, Smart Objective Setting for Managers. Yes. Um, And as a follow up to that, I wrote um, The Manager's Dilemma, How to Empower Your Team's Problem Solving, um, which as a concept came very much from my own personal experiences of managing uh, people. And so I'm sure we'll get into that in a bit more detail. Um, uh, so I have focused in on writing that and publishing that and we're also getting the smart objective setting for managers on a, an audio book. So that has come out on audio. 
Brilliant. So we've been very busy. And yes, yes like it's been really like we're connected on, on LinkedIn, obviously. And it's been really great to watch the journey of, you know, and what cover should I use and, and what should the, the book actually be called? Here's the concept of what it's about. But yes. what, what should it be called? So it's been really great to kind of watch the journey, the evolution of how that has all come about. And now you have the final product, which I have read and thoroughly enjoyed and have loads of notes on and, um, you know, really resonated. I'm not managing anyone as such now because I run my own business. But as I start taking people on, it's something I definitely need to to bear in mind. But also, you know, I could think back to when I was managing people in the past or even when I was being managed by other people and, and how it kind of how it all ties in together. What do you think in relation to, you know, describing the overall like meaning of the book or, or what it's all about? How would you describe it? Yeah, well, the, I, the book is definitely resonating with a lot of managers. So when I talk about it, or if they read it, they're like, oh, yes, this, <laughs> this is <laughs> me. Heads nodding, <laughs> screaming out. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and re- really, it is. In my experience, and I've, I, as I said, the, the book and the concept of the or where I identified at first was my own experience of managing people, and then in terms of because I do a lot of executive coaching and mentoring and 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 leadership development, and that, um, I had, I, I I was listening to to a group of people um, as part of a mentoring program, and they were talking, and I was going, oh, hold on a second, I've heard this, I've experienced this before. Yeah. Um, and I threw my concept out on the table to them and they were all like, yes, that's it. Um, and what, what what it is, is well, for me, is managers, t- people who tend to do well in management tend to be good problem solvers. Now, I don't know if there's a dynamic of people get are get promoted into management because they are good problem solvers. Um, I suspect that is a, hard, a large part of it. Um, or are they good problem solvers because they're in management. I, I think it's more they get promoted. It's like a chicken and egg situation yeah. almost. Yeah. OK. Because they're good at problems, because they can see ways around challenges and they can find ways to move issues and, ch- you know, pieces of work and, and um, along, whether it's projects, whether it's business as usual, and they'll come up with ways to sort of overcome the issue. And so they get noticed and they get seen and in reality, who gets promoted as people that are helpful, you know, people stand out in, in managers' minds. And for any manager listening, think about the people you give pieces of work to or ask for help from. They're the ones that are going to kind of move the project along or move the piece of work along and get it pr- progressed. Yeah. Um, so we tend to give them more. And so therefore they get more opportunities and they get more exposure and they get noticed more. And so therefore when a pr- an opportunity arises for promotion, they are more likely, their name is more likely to be in the pot. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, we get promoted because of what we do well, which is problem solving. Um, but of course, when we're in the problem, so, you know, when, when we're promoted up and somebody brings up an issue to us, you know, what does somebody who's very good at problem solving tend to do? The natural response is to problem solve. Yeah. Their role has now changed. So is this dile- dilemma or this dichotomy of, of I, I tend to be good at problem solving or I naturally tend to be a good problem solver. So therefore, when something is put, an issue is put in front of me, I will seek to solve the problem and seek to come to a solution. However, my role is now to develop other people and to enable other people on the team to um, be able to, 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 to do their own work. Um, and is this an issue that they really should be able to solve themselves and I need to coach them through the process or do I just take it from them or just give them the answer because it's faster? And so there's this real dichotomy that arises and that's the dilemma for managers. They've been promoted based on being good at problem solving and um, they've been rewarded for that. And what we tend to do is to keep doing what we're rewarded for because we were rewarded. And if we were rewarded once, we'll be rewarded again and rewarded again. So why wouldn't we keep doing that? Um, You know, whereas in reality, when you get to a certain level, you know, if you have a team of five, you can do that. If you get up to a team of 15 or you get into a team of 20 or 50 with three levels, you can't do that anymore. We're actually, while in the short term, it seems a good idea, in the longer term, it's actually... um, has a, a negative it's detrimental, yeah, yeah, to the manager and obviously yeah. to the team as well. Yeah. Um, 
So that was that's really the crux of the the, the book is that that whole dichotomy, that whole dilemma that managers yeah. end up unwittingly in. I mean, I don't think an awful lot of people they end up in the situation, but they're not intentionally ending up in the situation. They're not yeah. consciously ending up in the situation. A lot of it's unconscious for them. I was going to ask and maybe take a little step back, be, you know, before diving into the concept of the book on your thoughts or maybe a discussion around this idea of people being promoted and whether or not people actually want to be managers or whether it's the prestige associated. I know this has come up quite a bit on the podcast in, in, in previous episodes where we talk about this idea of, um, you know, that exactly what you're talking about. You're good at what it is that you do, but you want to continue doing that. But then you want to get paid more. You want to get the recognition for, you know, and, and the, the clear way to do that is to become a manager in most organizations. Yeah. You know, any any thoughts on, on that being kind of a, a dilemma pre-manager that do I want to actually manage people and develop them or do I want to be become an expert? Yeah. And it, it, this is, so, as I, I do some work with clients around org design as well, and this is a regular conversation that comes up um, for individuals, for managers, for, for you know, organisational, how do we set out the organisation? And even with in conversations with org design specialists that are working in companies, they're saying, you know, well, you know, we've introduced more expert roles. And, you know, I, I mean, my, my question was, well, is that to a certain level? Because at some point there is, a, I know there's been org design wise, there's been a move towards, you know, flatter organizations and less, you know, more, um, more, uh, autonomous. kind of natural moves and things like that as well. Yeah. 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 But there are trade offs with all of this. Uh, there are trade offs around getting people to the level of being autonomous sufficiently, to develop them sufficiently to be autonomous enough to be able to run with things and to really run it at a certain level. Um, so there's the process of getting people up to that level of autonomy where they, they can they can act as an expert and be and, and and I suppose the value of being an expert being produced within the, the organization's performance. Um, there is also the piece around um the, the cost of that, like if, if you if you're an expert and you're you're being paid a hundred thousand, versus you know three people who are doing something at a more junior level and maybe on thirty thousand, th this trade off. So you have to really show a huge amount of value at that level. Uh, and they're just examples, money, monetary value. But you know yeah. you have there's only so many of those roles an organisation can, um they can deliver on because their business model is set out, you, you know, when you price things, whether it's a product or a service, when you price it, um, the, the, you know, there's just the cost of the labor, which is obviously the biggest cost. There's the cost of the other, you know, the, the, the insurance and the whatever other, the, the proper, you know, the, the office block, although that's yeah. somewhat up in the air at the moment. Um, but there's the, the, the cost of all of that or whatever, right? And all of that. And then there's the profit. OK, so all of that gets put into the price of the product or service from the business model perspective. So if you introduce a load of experts at a much more a senior, you know, higher price tag in a very, you know, practical business, running a business, running a profitable business or whatever, there's only so many of those roles you can have. You can have more managers because they are, responsible for a huge amount more work you know you, you could be a manager could be responsible for the work outputs of 20 people so you can justify the value of the cost yeah, of that yeah, yeah. much more than you can justify the cost of 20 you're know, paying 20 experts yeah we still only produce the output of 20 experts. I think that's a really, really valuable point, Ariel. And it's not something that I've heard people talk about in, in such an articulate way. Um, and it's so important to consider because that like, I suppose the, the future of work is to offer people these opportunities where if they don't want to develop people, if they if that's not where their core skill set lies, then they have opportunities. But you make a really valid point as if you want to earn more money, ultimately, really what you're going to have to do is brush up your skill set and learn how to develop other people or put other people at the centre of what it is that you're doing or achieve results through other people. Like that's ultimately where we want to end up. Yeah. Or you have to be so productive 
the outcome, the value of what you produce to the business has to be so worth so much. So there are experts that absolutely do get huge paid large amounts of money because of the value that they bring to the organization and the expertise is so um, unique or is so um, uh, rare, do, do you know, like is it so, uh, um, it's so hard to get yeah. that, you bring that level of value to the organization. And so, you, you know, and, and again, you get a lot of this in the tech world in terms of, of um, program developers or whatever, yeah. because they can develop something that will then go on to be sold. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thousands of people. So their output might be, you, you know, it's the what the what the what the company can do with that output is so valuable that that the company can go. Yes, we can justify this. Yeah. 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 You know, if if you're if you're doing, you know, but but there's there's a lot of roles that that and a lot of functions that don't add that level of value, and so to have that expertise, it's that you have to have a sufficiently large impact on the organization or other people within the organization. Yeah. A, 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 a multiplier effect of what mm. the person is earning. Um, and so that in it, so if you, if you kind of apply that to the business model, in effect, you end up with a pyramid of there are so many. Positions. I always thought it looks like a pyramid scheme, you know, when you start going working in these large organizations, <laughs> there's one CEO at the top and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and there's only one head of whatever the different functions yeah. are, and stuff or whatever. And the idea is that it, that you know, if you're a head of a function, the idea is that the value you bring in running that function, and that you you know, the the, the vision you bring to that function, the alignment you bring to the the purpose of the function within the organization, the process, as I said, the productivity of that function in terms of the organization's ability to deliver deliver its overall objectives or whatever. That's where the value comes. And so that's why somebody at that level can be paid more because yeah. they're leveraging the whole capability of the function. Yeah. And that, that kind of brings us back around to this this idea of dilemma. And one thing that sprung to mind as you were talking about the dilemma was not just that that managers are good problem solvers, but they actually enjoy doing it as well. It's something that actually gives them the sense of purpose or gives them, gives them a, a sense of fulfillment at work when they are yeah. able to solve those problems. Is that something that you think is is maybe an issue as well? Um, yeah, and and like to be honest, if one is a good problem solver but doesn't want to to ma- necessarily manage, like being a troubleshooter within an organization and being able to problem solve real big issues that are going on in an organization, that isn't a way of being an expert and leveraging your value to the organ, leveraging that capability and and increasing the value to the organization. Um, so it, like I suppose. You know that that's where you end up with with um, you know org design people or you you end up with product design people where mm. they can be, you know they're experts they're very good at problem solving so they're and, and project managers can often be very good at problem solving and they're they're moving things along and um, so problem solving in itself is an ext- I, I've actually never come across an organization that doesn't value and doesn't require the skill of problem solving. Mm. And I would, over the years, have done an awful lot of work around competency frameworks and yeah. I've moving into role dimensions. And I've never, you know, and I've worked with numerous companies in, in that space. Um, and problem solving is always one of those ones that come up um, as a requirement, as a core competency. Um, what they expect of it might be slightly different from organization to organization, but I've yet to come across an organization that doesn't value it. Um, I think it, 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 it. I suppose what ends up happening is a lot of times the problem solving ends up residing in the manager's role because managers okay. are good at it, and so you know, so it sort of naturally, it's not necessarily that it it only needs to reside in managers. It's just that people that are tend to be good they get promoted up, yeah. which is into management, and it ends yeah. up into that process. So yeah. I think there probably is an argument for an organization who's very clearly thinking about its capabilities and what its needs and kind of saying, well, maybe there are some expert roles around problem solving and troubleshooting or whatever, but I don't think they're having the conversations or thinking about it in that term. Mm. That's actually what a huge amount of what they value in managers. Yeah. Do you know what Already, I mean? yeah. yeah, that that kind of brings us on to this, and this is one of the kind of the first notes that I took from the book is the idea 
of completing tasks at the right level. And it sort of ties in with what you were talking about a second ago about this expert status and how much people get paid versus multiple junior roles getting paid kind of less, like having three at 30K rather than one at 100K and you get more people, you know, you, you, all of this kind of stuff. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that issue of, of doing tasks at that right level? Oh, I love that topic. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, years ago, uh, when I was managing a team, I one of the, I, I was uh, um, basically the head of the ran the, the training, learning, development team in an, in an organisation, and as I got involved in all sorts of things, I, you know, involved in competency frameworks and performance management design and recruitment process design, all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that I did, and this has gone back many, many years, but even then I was kind of saying, I did an analysis of um, of how, you know, you take 10% of work being escalated up and being, you know, being pushed up into the next level up of, a, of an organization within a team. Um, and I'm very, very quickly, you know, the team lead, the manager very, very quickly gets swamped. Yeah. Mm. You know, you kind of think, oh, 10 percent isn't that much. You do the figures on it or whatever. And very quickly, your your team lead is doing nothing but 10 percent of other people's jobs. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And that's a lot of work that they're not doing of their own job. So I've always been fascinated with this concept of, you know, what is the what is the purpose of each role? Yeah. The output of each role. What should each role does that d- deliver? What, you know, the output and the volumes of outputs. Um, and how much should that be done and at that level? Um, and then what's the purpose of the next level up and in ter- you know, and the next level up again? So you, you work all the way up. And in reality, what happens is people do get promoted. They, you know, they, they, they show good. Uh, I've never come across an industry that doesn't promote off the back of somebody's technical capabilities, which again, you think about the technical capabilities and problems. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It happens all the time. The technical. So I've yeah. never come across, and I've never come across anybody who's ever said, said to me, well, actually, in our organisation, we do promote on people's demon- demonstrable ability to manage people. Yeah. I've never come across yeah. anybody who's even challenged that with but me. But maybe can we dive into that a little bit and say, you know, how can we change that? I know, like, the, the perception for me, like if I'm thinking as an individual and if someone was promoted who maybe had less experience than I did, and this has happened in the past, you know, if they had less experience or if they um, yeah, if they weren't familiar with the industry, all of these kind of stuff plays into that. And, you know, and I'm, the emotions are rising now. I'm like, no, that, I hope that doesn't happen. However, at the same time, like maybe it's a, an entire paradigm shift that needs to happen in work where we say people who are good at focusing on other people, of developing other people, of getting the best from other people are the ones that need to be promoted to be managers. And that it's still that kind of flat structure almost that the prestige maybe isn't associated as much with the manager, but it's just a different skill set that people have in relation to getting the best out of others. Yeah. Um, So there's an awful lot there to unpack. (laughs) (laughs) So one of the things in my experience is one of the things is that there is a lack of clarity around what the purpose of different levels are and yeah. a lack of clarity around how roles change. Mm. And, and a reliance, you might say, on job descriptions, which are also used as job ads, which are also used as. Yeah. yeah. And job descriptions are generic by yeah. definition. They have to be whatever. So one of the things I've actually um, started doing with organisations is um, building out role dimensions and mm. um, so it is it's like a combination of competencies technical outputs uh, value st- standards volumes that kind of stuff um plus um uh, so there's technical there's outputs what the what the output what the organ what the role is org- designed to deliver um, and competency behaviors. Okay. Mm. So the likes of problem solving, what exactly do we expect, et cetera. Um, but then what happens is I develop that out by job family. Mm. So what people can actually see is the development of the skill set and how it changes over time. Yeah. And what happens is over time, the for managers, the more you move into management, the less it's about your technical skills and the more it is about your ability to develop to plan, to have a vision, to lead people, to, um, and so 
in reality, even the best organizations in the world, they might have all of their technical processes mapped. Okay. If you actually go in and talk to them about what are your management processes, many of the management processes aren't mapped, Mm. aren't clearly defined. It is assumed. Um, So, you know, most people don't focus in on most organizations, most managers aren't trained to. How do you train on the job? How do you share knowledge? How do you hold people accountable for applying that knowledge and developing them up to be able to take on the responsibilities of the tasks that is part of their role? And nobody sits down with managers and says, this is how your role is now going to change. These are how the skills are you are now going to need to develop. There is none of that conversation. Mm. There is none of that clear understanding. And yeah. that's what the whole dimensions do. It articulates what's different yeah. about each of the roles and how the, 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 the skills need to develop. Yeah. That's, and change and the that's knowledge. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And it's more than just, as I've, as I've mentioned already, I've done a huge amount of work in competencies. But what I find with organizations and managers in particular within organizations is, the organization might have a competency framework, but it's not intuitive to the manager. The manager doesn't understand how do I take this and how do I translate it? it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, really, they really struggle. They're going, that, that may be so, but I don't understand how that competency framework relates to the jobs in my team. Yeah. Um, and so where the role dimensions makes it much more specific to the job family and the manager can go, oh, okay, I can see how, I see how this develops. And that, that, but, but also everybody in the team sees how it develops. So the conversations can now start ha- being have had with people around. The person goes, well, I only like the technical stuff or whatever. And it's like, that's fine. But that only brings you to this level. Yeah. Be here at this next level. You need to start looking at networking or you need to start looking at influencing much yeah. more heavily or you need to start looking at whatever it is. Um, You know, people, they can see, but they can see how they need to develop in what ways. But they can also see that it's only maybe a slight step up in five different areas. And Mm -hmm. that doesn't seem quite as as scary. Yeah. Actually, I don't really know what it is a manager does. And it doesn't look like much fun. (laughs) It's just what you get a lot of people saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. It doesn't look like much fun. It looks like Dealing with other people's issues, their personal problems. Yeah. 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 Um, and it's kind of like, well, of course, if the manager is struggling and doing those things and things keep crowding in on the manager and the manager is taking on other people's work that they shouldn't really, of course, it's going to look quite mm. scary and not much fun and not something people want to do. Yeah. So by having kind of a much clearer, so what happens when when managers get promoted, going back to you, you were kind of saying about managers, kind of the work being done at the right levels. Managers have a much clear, by understanding the role dimensions, the managers have a much better understanding of what the roles are expected from their, and I, in talking to managers, I often find they don't really know what the expectations yeah. of a role is and yeah. you know, what, what are they supposed to deliver? Yeah, and like, I, find, you know? I find that a lot, Ariel, that managers maybe don't even understand the expectation of them. So yeah. how can yeah. they then explain the expectation of someone below them? And I think for me, setting clear expectations is really critical for work generally, like just to, to actually do work, knowing what you're there for, knowing the purpose, knowing what good looks like, what excellent looks like, what what's good enough versus what's not really worth spending the extra hour or couple of hours on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that is just so prevalent. Um, and what happens with managers when they get promoted? Up, so aside from the problem solving piece yeah. that the book is about, um, the, the the manager doesn't really know what's different about their role or what they should be doing or what skill sets they should be applying. And so in the absence of not knowing that and not being sure about it, and again, that these things aren't necessarily clearly articulated within organizations and clearly mapped out, what they do is they kind of go, well, I liked this bit of my old job. Yeah. I'll take that with me. So I'll yeah. take bits with me. Yeah. So they might take bits with them. Um, and so... The, the levels below them, whatever number of levels that is, whatever bits of their job are being taken off them, you know, and then and then they might also have parts of their job that they're not sure about and they escalate and they kind of go, I'm having, I need some help here, some support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And the manager goes, oh, I'll just take it from you. Oh, OK, very grand. Yeah. And there's some people who get irritated with that. There's some people who kind of go, woohoo, here you go. Yeah. Here's another load of stuff as well. Yeah. Um, and then there's other people who kind of go, mm, just the way it is. And I just kind of keep ticking on. Yeah. Doing my own bits and pieces. But that, that kind of, that's almost like the full circle. If that comes back to this is the work being done at, at the incorrect level. And, you know, it comes back to this idea of how much you're getting paid for the skills that you have and what you should be doing and, and the breakdown of what you're getting paid versus what you're the impact that you're having on yeah. the organization or, or the or the your capabilities or your ability to develop other people and, and all of that. Yeah. Um and then and you and you bring that back into the org design and you bring it back into the business model and the whole thing gets out of sync. Yeah. Yeah. Um so so it ends up in effect, it's costing the business an awful lot more to deliver the outputs or the outcomes of whatever it is the product yeah, is yeah. they're selling. Um, yeah. And so that makes them less profitable or it makes them, you, you know, it has the knock on impact. Yeah, on them. they're less productive and therefore they're less. Yeah, ultimately it's it's impacting on their profits, but it's as a result of, of people. And I think for me, always when you focus on people first and, you know, putting the focus back on, you know, for me, creating those happier working environments. But this includes all of the, the those things that you talked about. Um, the, the profits will follow from that, you know, and yeah. it's focusing on the people element first. But, but what you were talking about sort of ties in with another one of the notes that I had, and this is the area of performance management. So someone might be cruising along thinking, I'm actually doing a good job here when they haven't received any feedback to the contrary or they don't understand what the expectations are and therefore they just assume that they're doing um, a good job. Do you want, I mean, performance management, there's lots, I suppose, to talk about in relation to that. Like, And the future of work, it seems, is moving away from this idea of performance management, but I'm not entirely sure what the alternative to that is. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to link it also into, you know, the great resignation and people yeah, being unhappy and all that kind of stuff yeah. or whatever. And when you read through a lot of that, that, that the the articles on it, a lot of times people are leaving because they are being left to flounder and they are being left to their own devices and yeah. they're not being developed and they're not being, they're not really getting real feedback. They're being left to flounder. They're not being, um, they don't see where they're going in the organization. They don't see a connection to the organization. And you couple that with work has gotten much more complex than the work that was done 20 or 30 years ago. And again, I'll bring this back to the the the, the entry, you know, the more inexperienced people and how they need to be developed up. Um, people are coming into organizations and they're looking to be developed and they need to be developed but the level of complexity of what they did, like if you, I, I don't know if I do it in this book or in the, the smart book, but if you take, say, accountancy, you know, back in the day, accountants were, you you, you learned, you know, you almost learned from first principles, right? Here's the receipts, put them into the ledger, da, 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 you know, you learned all that. And there was an awful lot of grunt work to it, but you learned it all and you built on top of that, right? Mm. Um, and so you kind of you had a very from first principles understanding of the work of an accountant, for example. Um, so but now, you, you know, the, the, so much of that is scanned in and is now available in the system, which means that the, what you are focusing your work in on as an entry level type person is much more around analysis and understanding, and, you know, and it's sort of um, which is an awful lot. It's a lot higher level work. And it's more complex work because you might not have the understanding behind it. Yeah. That you would have built up in the old ways. OK. Yeah. So all of a sudden, the manager isn't just going, take this receipt, put it into a credit or a debit and da 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 and keep doing that. Right. Mm. All of a sudden, it's like I now have to explain or we need to make sure that your understanding of the concepts are in place. So that you can analyze it sufficiently so you can identify something that isn't Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. of a sudden, the 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 ability to train somebody up and to develop them has become an awful lot more complex. Yeah. And to break it down, that to break that down into its constituent parts, to be able to impart that or whatever, is becoming so much more complex 
if, if, if managers and whether that's team leaders or whoever it is, is, is having problems with doing that for people. You can see how people are getting left floundering and yeah. left frustrated and left Absolutely. leaving. Yeah. And so that it gets into this whole the, the great resignation piece or whatever, where they're frustrated around and they're and they're leaving. They don't feel valued at work. Yeah, they don't yeah. feel valued and they don't feel they're they, they don't feel they're developing and they don't feel they're really understanding what they're doing. So they've mm. got, kind of got this level of constant level of not really being sure. And again, get, bringing in the imposter syndrome, kind of yeah. feeling quite right. And that's a level of uncomfortableness that people yeah. Kind of, are, it's not much fun living with on a regular basis, no. right? And so people kind of you go, well, I'll go somewhere else, and they find out it's not necessarily much better anywhere exactly, else. Exactly. Yeah. But they're now yeah. kind of going, Dude, now what do I do? Because yeah, yeah. Now I really I must be an imposter. <laughs> yeah. Um. So it doesn't help them. So then, linking that back to 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 performance management, um, and it also links back to what I was already talking about about the role dimensions and the expectations and having the clear vision of this is what this role is about and mm-hmm. this is what you need to master in order to get to a level of mastery in this role to yeah. be feeling that you're you're doing well and then ready for the next opportunity. So as part of the start of your career development and that, you know, we talk about performance management and it losing its 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 sort of role and that kind of stuff. I, I don't think it has been updated to take understanding of the complexities of the the, the knowledge war. Because it was designed in the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 1960s around, you know, you know output of widgets. You know, it was a lot to do with production lines yeah. and to do with inflation and how, who are we going to pay a bit more to or whatever. I mean, that was where it came from. Um, so... I, I think it needs to be updated to, and again, this is where I've worked with clients around the role dimensions piece around designing that out and setting out the clear expectations. Because what I've found is when I've introduced this model to organisations and we've sat down and talked to people, they've been kind of, went, I didn't know that was part of my job. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds, yeah. sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know I was. And then you're going to go, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. That's why we're having this discussion. And mm. they're going, that makes perfect sense. I, I get where you're going. I get what I'm supposed to be doing now. I yeah. get why these things are all important. And not only do I get why they're important in this role, but I get why they're important in my next role. Mm. I get where I need to develop them out now and how it'll adjust and increase the, 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 the what's expected of me in this area in the next level. I see how that will increase. And that to me is the purpose. And I've actually moved away from we're calling it performance management to, to performance development because okay, I think yeah, yeah, that's yeah. more akin to what we need to be doing. It's much more reflective of this isn't about managing your performance. This is about developing you into being mastered in your role, yeah. mastered in all elements of it. And a lot of times, especially at the junior levels, and it makes sense at the junior levels, but a lot of times it's like it's people are trained up to just do the work of the job. They don't necessarily bring in the, their role in supporting the organisation. Yeah, like the thinking that goes behind it, the kind of critical analysis. Is this really necessary or am I doubling up here yeah. or um, well, like what's the purpose of this or am I delivering this to a client and could we find a more efficient way to do it? You know, there's loads of things, I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, I mean, are, the, are those things that people naturally have or are they things that they that it needs to be called out to them and then they can figure it out or do they need to be trained in how to do that? Yeah. And, and you know, if you're if you're, you know, in a, in a junior role or whatever, it does need to be because that's and that's part of what connects you to the organization around having that, that, that I'm not just a person here doing this. It's that I have a connection with the organization and equally the organization has a connection with the individual. It's not just a one way thing, you know. But by putting in the, the the effort to really develop out an effective performance development process and training the people, you know, the, the, the managers in particular, on how to develop people and the skills and the, the approach to it and all that, um, and having an understanding, that, that in itself is a commitment to people's development. Yeah, yeah. Also, even the language going from performance management to performance development, it's recognising, well, it is going to take that. And uh, there's uh, so many roles. And again, I don't think this has been properly acknowledged or taken into consideration. Going back to the example of the, 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 the accountant, if it is more complex, it is going to take longer to master. Yeah. Whereas there's almost this expectation of like it should take three months and you're done. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now, <it's just> <laughs> now you should know everything. 
And you're kind of going, no, because it's so much more complex. So you need an amount of experience and knowledge and background understanding mm. and all that kind of stuff to be able to properly do the job to the right level. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, there are some roles that there are some roles and there are some some industries or whatever that that. That, that that may still be true, that you can master the job in three months or whatever, mm. and you're up to speed or whatever, and, and, and absolutely. But there are an awful lot more jobs and an awful lot more industries that are getting much more complex. Yeah. So it's not about performance management or, you know, it, it's a, it's only becomes performance management after you've been two or three years in the role and you've mastered the role. That's when it becomes performance management. Up till then, it's been performance development. Uh, still learning the role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think that's, uh, oh, look, I, I could talk for hours on it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a really, it's a really good point, I think. And for me, it's something I, I, I always talk about is one of the needs for relatedness. And that is, for me, it's the sense of belonging with your teammates and getting along with other people in the organisation. But it's also that connection with the organisation. And what I do on a day-to-day basis matters. And here's the impact that I'm making on the organisation. And here is the direct impact on the the client or the internal per- person that you're dealing with, like, and really making it obvious and spelling out for people, especially as you said in those more junior roles, what this actually means and and what the what the impact is. Um, but another one of the um the areas, I suppose, and th- this is more kind of generic on, on the the um the book, is it can be um the idea that. The, from a manager's perspective, it's tempting to jump in and solve the problem. But from the individual's perspective, it's tempting to offload the thinking and the workload to your manager. And we kind of touched on that a little bit already. And the easy temptation that that, that actually is and how easy it is for that to happen and the resulting of it's, you know, it's not the work is not being done at the right level but how easy it is for, for that kind of thing to happen. And it kind of results in this lack of autonomy then for, for taking responsibility. And maybe you've kind of almost answered that already in relation to this role dimensions work that you do because that kind of solves that problem and, and setting the really clear expectations of what needs to be done. But even going beyond that and explaining to people the impact of you escalating something or the impact of you taking on work that needs to be done at a different level is this and this is how it impacts the organization yeah um so again i, I mean i think we probably have talked about it in, in terms of the the infrastructures and the broad um overview of it um i, I remember one person said to me um shared a story with me um who, who had read the book shared a story with, with me that he had been um you know seconded to a particular team in a different country and he was solving all the problems. You know, it was that classic solving all the problems he, and everybody he, was coming He goes to in and he's like, right, I'm here to solve all the problems that you've ever had. Um, yeah. So he did whatever he was supposed to do. The guy, the team were just coming to him the whole time. What about this? What about that? What about the other? And so whatever length of time he was there, he came, he, he went back home to his own country and they kept calling him the whole time. What do I do here? What do I do here? What do I do here? So he, he actually had sort of embedded himself yeah. so deeply, yeah, yeah. unintentionally. Yeah. Um, but generated and, additional work for himself, surely, as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But also to the point where he, he couldn't, he they wouldn't let him go. So he was actually holding himself back. Yeah. Unwittingly, because then he had to go back in. He had yeah. to go back and he yeah. had to go. And so um, and and, and so it becomes more about empowering other people to be able to solve their own problems, which is, yes. again, like the kind of the key point of, of the book. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And and then it also allows the manager. So it's it's empowering the team, but it's also empowering the manager because constantly asking, answering people's questions and giving them the answers and dealing with their problems actually disempowers the manager yeah. as much as it disempowers the team. Because it holds them back slightly as well. Back, yeah. yeah. Okay. And they're not focusing in on the things that they're supposed to be doing and they're too busy and then opportunities don't come up for them. And so the whole thing kind of ends up in this sort of yeah. spiral yeah. completely, oftentimes completely unintentionally. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think it, a lot of it is it is unintentional. Yeah. It is. Yeah. 
I think one of the things, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things could be an issue of time. So people are under so much time yes. pressure these days and it takes more time to yes. explain to someone how to solve their own problem rather than just taking it off them and doing it yourself. And it's that investment of time that is required up front for the kind of the longer term. And maybe it's the it's the quick payoff of, oh, I'll just do it this time and the next time I'll teach them how to do it themselves or whatever it might be. Um, any any thoughts on, on the kind of causes, like what are the main yeah. causes of this? A huge part of it is it just seems faster and that is absolutely, um, uh, it's the short-term pain versus mm. the long-term gain. Yeah. Um, or it feels like the short-term gain, but actually it's leading to long-term pain. Yeah. Um, and this actually, I do, this is something I've done for many, many years. I get in, in this comes up regularly in management training programs and I get the, the, the guys to do up the figures from it. And um, if you do up the figures on a 10 minute task that you do every day or a 50 minute, ta- like an hour task you take from somebody that you really shouldn't be taking from somebody um, and you multiply it out, it turns out it is, if you were to train them up on how to do the task, it might take you something like, half a day mm. uh, and but if you keep doing the task over a year it's the equivalent of about a week wow yeah. so i do that um uh, regularly i do up the numbers and let them work it through whatever and you can see their draws drop and go yeah. oh, and you're going and that's just one task yeah they're not supposed to be doing yeah and then they go oh now i understand why i'm working my overtime so <laughs> yeah 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 um, but I, but I, on that like year, and this is years ago it's going back to that company when i was working i was running the the the, the learning team the development team and uh, we had somebody in on the a guy who just newly promoted up and they were really in bad shape in terms of and he was in really you know <sighs> It was, there was a lot of time being spent trying to get through men, his mindset to shift, getting his mindset to shift. Yeah. Anyway, we did, it was a two and a half day course. We, clearly the mindset did, did shift. Because I met him about three months, six months later, I think I met him and he was all, and you know, the guy was just like uh, attending the course. He could barely find the time to attend the course. And <laughs> anyway, about six months later, I met him and I was like, oh, you don't normally meet you here. And he was like, oh yeah, yeah. And I was, he was like, oh yeah, no, it's all great. And I was like, really what happened? And you know, he was like, oh yeah, took your, you know, what you talked about in the program, put it into practice, completely changed around. I said, that's great. Would you come to the next session and talk to the guys or whatever mm-hmm. that was? He's like, absolutely. And he said, because I have time now. Yeah. So we went and he was explaining how horrendously the team had been performing. Mm. How in three months, and it was a monthly cycle that they were on. So three, three cycles, basically. How within three months, they had completely and utterly turned it around. That's incredible. Well, yeah. Well, and one, people were like, oh my goodness, you know. And he said, they were like, where did you find the time? Because people were working 14 hour days two out of every four weeks. Yeah. This had been what had been going on. And they said, where did you find the time on this? And he said, when the 15th hour is the hour that's digging you out of the hole, that's the most important. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he recognized, yes, this is an additional hour on top of my 14 hour days, Mm. but this is the hour that's going to actually make the difference. Make the difference. Yeah. I'm going to get out of this. So it was the short term pain of, yeah, a few more hours but the long term gain of my team is now functioning at the level it's supposed to the work yeah. is being at the right level and that was a perfect example of the, the more junior people were like skipping out the door at five o'clock every day of the month every day of the month whatever while the, the, the team leads the man, assistant manager the manager were all working 14 hour days yeah before because they haven't taught people how to do kind of the more basic stuff and they're just yes. cruising yes. Yes. cruising along <laughs> <laughs> and the quality of the work was like the client was in effect doing the quality checks and the work. Oh, because wow. They were, they were too busy doing the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that the client was, so the client, as you can well imagine, was jumping up and down going bananas. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I yeah. found this mistake, yeah. sending it back, send it back to yeah. report. So there's an error here in one yeah. of your formulas. Yeah, <laughs> it rings a bell. So yeah. it's really about like investing time up front. And I think that, I mean, you can apply that principle or that concept across the board, really, like doing that reflection piece or really looking at how am I spending my time and not just time, but like, you know, what are the things that I'm doing and what do I not need to do? What do I really need to do? Who should be doing what things? Yeah. Um, I think you can kind of apply that to lots and lots of different situations. Um, yes. 
Ariel, I'm, con- I'm, I'm kind of conscious that we've talked around the book rather than talking about it. Is there anything in particular that you wanted to share? I know like there's examples of the, the different types of people and the different types of issues that people encounter. I don't know, do you want to kind of touch on that or do you want to leave that for people to actually read in the book when they when they go out and buy it themselves? Yeah, I, I, I think, um, I, I suppose just, uh, you know, for, for listeners who are thinking, what exactly is the book about? <laughs> <laughs> what we have talked about. Um, I suppose some of it is some of it is the mindset of the manager and that that, that we talked about and the dilemma which we, you know that that have been good at problem solving and then um uh, you know and then kind of just solving people's problems for them whether it's giving them the answer or taking it from them but the book also goes into actually how do you um what are the steps of problem solving because a lot of times pro- manager we go through the problem solving steps so quickly that we're actually not that clear around what the problem stuff so mm. problem solving step are so one of the things in the book that the book does very i think explicitly and, and feedback has come back from people of actually just having that that um framework for different- yeah and just knowing i think which step each individual is at and being able yeah. to identify that is really it's, useful yeah um so breaking down the steps into its their constituent parts and what the purpose of each step is i think it's even just having that clarity for managers to recognize oh okay um these are the steps that i go through very quickly because managers because it's so innate to them yeah it's almost so unconscious them. isn't it yeah. yeah they've already like you know they, they might have already ahead. <laughs> yeah, they might have already gone through about three or four steps in what feels like one step to yeah. them. Mm. So by breaking it down into the constituent parts, it makes it easier to see um, where somebody, which step somebody might be getting stuck on. Yeah. And, and that's then, the, then the, the second half of the book very much goes into kind of the, I suppose, the, the archetypes of mm. who shows up in the workplace and where they might get stuck on each of the steps, what that yeah. might look like. Um, but also, how would you develop them from that point if you've yeah. identified? Well, actually, I've got somebody who's a great problem identifier, but doesn't that, and they think their job is done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then they bring it to me. You know, I need to get them from identifying that they, you know, identifying, being good at identifying the problem, right the way through process of do I need to spend any time I might have identified the problem but do I need to actually spend any time solving this problem Mm. problem identifiers seem to have a tendency to see all problems that they identify as the same impact okay same level of importance when Mm. in reality they're not and but they because they think their job is only to identify the problems they 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 go well I've identified it so you sort of yeah 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 yeah. now I'll escalate it to you to solve it yeah you're kind of taking people from that stage, you know, if, if you've got somebody who's getting stuck at that step right the way through to, you know, trust and confidence, which is, you know, the, the, the belief in themselves to make mm. the decisions. Yeah. To kind of, this is the solution. And so um, there are a lot of different ways in which an individual can get stuck along the problem solving process. Yeah. And so the book also helps managers. It's not just around them kind of, I suppose, examining their own um, mindset around the problem solving and how they, they approach it with their team. Um, but it's also around helping them to be able to identify which people on my team are getting stuck at which step and how would I develop them? How would I build that confidence in them mm-hmm. at each stage um, to get them to be competent at prob- most mm-hmm. problems? Um, but also it also goes into, which I think is also really, really important, is goes into the what are what are valid reasons for escalation and what are invalid reasons yeah. for escalation. Yeah, because oftentimes we don't, as managers, we don't necessarily differentiate between them. We just go, "Oh, it has been escalated, and so mm. therefore I have to deal with it." Yeah, instead of saying, "Well, actually, um, these are valid reasons for escalation. Mm. These are not valid reasons for escalation." They don't necessarily explain to people what the invalid reasons are, but certainly having a conversation around what the valid reasons for escalation are is appropriate, so that people understand that. But also what the expectations are when somebody is escalating an issue to the manager that yeah. it's not just that I identified it here you go sort it yeah. it's the well what have you done about it and mm. where have you gotten it from and what are you looking for from me in yeah. turn what yeah. is the real ask here um, and I do reference this in, in, in the states for example it's very common for a manager to go what's the ask but even in that it's I don't think that th- that's halfway towards 
how that needs to be framed. It's not just what's the ask. It's what have you, that might be the ask, but what have you done in relation to solving this yourself? And now what's the ask? Yeah. What have you already tried? What solutions have you looked at? How far have you got in terms of identifying how big of a problem this is? You know, all of those things. Yeah. 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 Um, And where are they getting stuck? And, you know, so yeah. so it's, it's kind of helping them to see where they're typically getting stuck and then how they can be coached through to build up their confidence. I mean, the ultimate aim is that the team members are confident in their problem solving abilities. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, for, for, for issues that are mainly within the ro- remit of their role. You know, you're not necessarily expecting them to solve all problems, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I expect you to be able to deal with ninety percent of what turns up in your own role. Yeah, if you've mastered it. Kind of, you're going to be able to deal with roughly ninety percent, eighty, ninety percent, or whatever. And um, there may be things that you need help with, and that, but that's one of the valid reasons of of escalation. Mm. Um, but I expect you to have done a decent amount and brought it to a certain point. Yeah, so and that understanding actually. What's the problem solving process? What's it, what are the valid reasons for escalating? How do I develop people from wherever their starting point is to being competent in de- in, 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 in developing or developing their problem solving to be able to deal with most of the things? And for those things that they are escalating with to me or whatever, that they're doing so and signposting it in the right way and that they've done sufficient amount. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm now only coming in and kind of coaching them to the end bit as opposed to taking it away and getting it sorted for them. Mm, yeah. A very, very different yeah. Um, approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the, I think the key points that comes across in the book is the manager as coach. So it's not manager as problem solver, it's manager as coach and developing people through that. And like for me, you know, from what you've said, from what I've experienced as a manager, from what I've experienced as an employee, this is a game changer. You know, how much time can be saved from doing this? And and in this age of everyone's so busy and there's back to back meetings and there's this, you know, don't get me started on the, the meetings and especially when they're back to back. But like just taking that additional time to invest in developing people to solve their own problems, in taking the time to think about things a little, you know, where can I, where do I need to step in versus where do I not need to step in? And having that much more clarity, I think for me, it's a game changer from a productivity perspective and from a performance perspective, reducing the amount of work that you actually need to do and improving your performance at the same time. Yes. Yes. Um, and then everybody wins as well because mm. uh, they're they're more confident, they're more competent in their yeah. role, they're more confident, they're more engaged, they're more, you know, that goes into, um, you know, one's motivation, um, the mastery and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and then they're ready and able for the next opportunity and whether that's a development into a different role or if it's development into a promotion, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, you know, it, it all starts begetting itself yeah. and they, they get promoted. Yeah, so they, they might get an opportunity, they get, might get volunteered for this, this opportunity, they get exposure to it, they go, actually, I really like that or that yeah. was a great thing or mm. enjoyed that or my profile has now increased or whatever. So now I'm more noticed than the organ. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. People, all that kind of stuff. And that, like, you know, that's part of, so now we're getting into a, a person's long-term, you know, career development and that kind of stuff. And, yeah. and so they're, they're, you know, they're, they're going to naturally, when they have built up their confidence that they can do this or whatever, that just opens so many doors for mm. them in terms of their own self-belief and their own confidence and yeah. their own capabilities. And, you know, and, and that, that, you know, if they say people leave managers, people stay with managers that do that for them. Yeah. 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 Who believe in them, who believe empower them. them. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah definitely. hundred percent. So Ariel, um, I know that the book is available on Amazon. I know that it has recently uh, been featured on Get Abstract as well. And also you've just finished recording the audio version of the book. So do you want to tell people how they can how they can get it, where they'll find it, where to pick it up? Yeah. Um, so the manager's dilemma, how to empower your team's problem solving is available on Amazon. It's also available on my website, evolutionconsulting.ie. Um, and as you said, yes, the uh, summary, if people have um, access to get abstract, the summary is there. Um, and the other book, the, the audio actually is of the smart objective setting for managers. Okay. 
Um, so that gets into that whole performance management development um, conversation we talked about. And it's really around um, the, the objective setting part of yeah. performance process, performance development process. And um, so that's also available on Amazon and my website. And it is also available in audio. Brilliant. That's the audio book. Uh, I will get back to the audio recording of the manager's dilemma in late 2022. Perhaps. OK, OK. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and your third um, book as well. Don't forget. Uh, oh, yes. So, uh, the, the, the first book that kicked off my writing career yeah. is uh, Values, Not Just for the Office Wall Plaque, How yeah. Personal and Company Values Intersect. And that goes into kind of personal values and develop uh, identifying them and yeah. how it and impacts the on our life. Yeah, yeah the importance yeah. of it. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully um, in the second half of 2022, the um, next book on the performance development theories um, will come out. So that will be focused in on effective feedback. Um, so again, that'll link through to, you know, setting the expectations properly yes. in the first place. And yeah, then yeah, being yeah. Able to, it's a lot easier when you You're do that. You're speaking my language now, Ariel. <laughs> feedback, <yeah. laughs> um, and then just feedback, as, you know, the, the, the ongoing feedback versus the yeah. formal feedback oh, and yeah, yeah, thing yeah. or whatever. So it's well, I can't wait down. to read that one. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to it already. Um, and if people want to reach out, if they want to connect with you, what's the best way? I presume LinkedIn and you mentioned your website as well, evolutionconsulting.ie. Yeah, so yeah. Evolutionconsulting.ie. Consulting, sorry, yeah, sorry. You're okay. Um, <laughs> evolutionconsulting.ie is the website and LinkedIn, um, Ariel O'Farrell on and LinkedIn. And then I'm also on Facebook, uh, evolutionconsulting.ie. And um, if you just want to follow the books, Ariel O'Farrell books on Facebook as well. Brilliant. Great. And I mentioned in one of my previous episodes that I'm going to change things up in relation to what I ask people about happiness at work. So normally I ask what makes you happier at work, but I'm changing things up now. I've made the decision uh, to when I talk about being happier at work, what kind, what comes up for you? Like what, what springs to mind? Um, I thought I had my answer all sorted from the last podcast <laughs> to this question and then you go and change it. Um, yeah, for me, um, when I hear happier, happier at work, for me, it's around contentment. Yeah. Um, so for me, I'm always a little bit, um, uh, I think happy when, when we're talking about happiness, I think it's, it's easier to, I suppose the expectation around happiness is that I'm a hundred percent happy. Um, at all the time, um, which means if I'm not 100% happy all the time, it can lead to unhappiness. So my personal reflections on this is more around contentment and which allows for recognising that maybe not everything is going right all the time, you know, that it's all going 100% right, but that sufficient amount of it is is good, um, is, is positive, that it's sufficient to be content and to kind of get that, that uh, this is where I'm um, you know, this is worthwhile and this is, it's worth continuing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it yeah. could, again, it could be that short term pain for the long term gain. So pain. it's more thinking about the longer term of maybe I don't feel entirely happy right now doing this, but actually I know that this is going to contribute to my long term happiness. Yes. Um, yes, and yes. And some of that, you know, when we when we might push ourselves out of our boundaries, there can be yeah. some of that un unhappy. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure about this. Yeah. Um, but recognizing, yes, but it's moving me towards what I want. Um, exactly. It's really good. And I, it's interesting. I see it with the books. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, with the, the next book. I've kind of got it mapped out and I've got the, the started on the book cover. Um, that hasn't gone out on LinkedIn yet because I need to go back and get more versions. So don't like them. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but it's interesting when I, you know, there is that sort of, you know, pain during the process. But when you get to the end of it and you go, oh, that's done now. Oh, that's now available. And that's, you know, and I can see kind of, you know, having three books and moving, you know, the audio book, getting that done. And there's yeah. quite a lot of pain in that, shall we say, yeah. even though I knew it was for the greater good for me. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, you know, there, there can be that short term pain piece that can reduce the happiness level. Yeah. Um, but recognising, yes, but it is moving me towards something that I want. A goal, towards, towards a sense of time. accomplishment or achievement. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, uh, so that to me is what comes up for me when I think about that happier. Yeah, happier. love it. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today, Ariel. I, as always, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy our chats. We probably could have just continued that for another few hours anyway, um, but always lots to talk about. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Uh, and likewise, I could talk to you for hours and hours <laughs> and it's been an absolute pleasure. 
That was Iriel O'Farrell talking all about The Manager's Dilemma and her new book of the same title. If you want to get involved in the conversation, I would love to hear your thoughts. Feel free to reach out to me directly on email or connect with me through my website, happieratwork.ie or through social media, Instagram, happieratwork.ie or LinkedIn, Aoife O'Brien. That's A-O-I-F-E-O apostrophe B-R-I-E-N. Now, in summarising some of the, the key points, really the crux of the manager's dilemma is that managers are good problem solvers and they get promoted because of what they do well. So managers get promoted because they have good problem solving skills, but their role really is to develop other people. And oftentimes this is not clear for managers that that what how their role changes when they become promoted to become a manager for the first time. But also they get stuck in doing what it is that they do well because the expectations haven't really been set out. We went slightly off topic for a second as well and talked about the fact that the new way of working, I think, is to provide these opportunities, not just for managing people, because not everyone necessarily wants to be a manager or not everyone in necessarily is good at being a manager. And so offering people this role of being an expert rather than a people manager provides another opportunity for people to progress in their careers, to earn more money. But actually what we were talking about is there's not really space to have all of those experts earning higher levels of money. And actually it's more important from a business perspective be to have managers because of the multiplying effect that they have and because of their responsibility for the workload of multiples of people and their responsibility for developing other people as well and the noticeable impact that that can have on the business. But equally, if you are an expert or if you can get to that expert status and show the level of impact that you are having and the value that you bring to the organisation, that can be achieved as well. We talked about doing work at that right level. And I think this is a very common problem for organisations based on my own experience, based on what Ariel was saying and from her experience as well. And it's this idea of people don't necessarily understand what the purpose of the role is, what the output that is expected or the volumes of output and how to get to that next level as well. And so Ariel went on to describe this idea of role dimensions rather than job descriptions. And in my own experience, job descriptions have tended to be very generic, very, um, you know, and they're being used for job ads as well, which is not really effective, but they're not very specific to the actual role itself. We touched on the idea of mapping management processes. So not just having a map of the technical processes that need to happen, but actually mapping out those management processes, because typically speaking, we're working on assumptions a lot of the time um, and getting them down onto paper can really make the difference. And things like how do you train on the job? How do you share knowledge? How do you give people accountability for actually doing what they said they would do? And questions that can be posed by managers as well. How do the competencies relate to the roles on my team? So making that connection for managers between the general competencies that are required in an organisation and how specifically what that means on a manager's team and the roles within that team. We talked as well about the great resignation and how people are being left to flounder. They're not getting feedback. They're, they don't see where they're going. They don't see how they're contributing to organisations. We talked about the fact that work has become a lot more complex. And the example that Ariel shared was this idea of accountancy, which I think is probably easy to relate to, you know, going from junior entry level to a um, more senior position. And because of the increase in complexity in these roles, it becomes a lot more complex to actually train people how to do them as well. So factoring that in, bearing that in mind. We talked about imposter syndrome and feeling that kind of uncomfortable feeling when you feel out of place, like you don't belong, like you're not good enough. And when people are not being trained properly, when they're feeling a little bit out of their depth, when they're feeling incompetent, that's when these feelings start to rise. And it doesn't necessarily change by them changing roles or going somewhere else because the same problem could be existing in that new place as well. 
We talked about this idea of performance development rather than performance management. So focusing more on developing people rather than this idea of managing people. And I know certainly, you know, my my own experience of using those forms, it seems to be a once a once a year tick box exercise. And the feedback was not really very useful to me. I, did, I wasn't really clear on what I was doing wrong, where I was being told I was, you know, things weren't exactly right. And, and certainly a couple of different occasions, the manager themselves couldn't articulate how I should develop and how I should improve. And they started then having to refer back to the job description. And and so the whole thing got a little bit messy. Another point that was made then was this idea of connecting junior people with the organisation. And for me, this is really satisfying a need for relatedness. So how does what I do on a day to day basis relate to what the organisation is trying to achieve? How does it impact on the end user, the end client? We talked as well about the idea of the short term pain for the long term gain. So taking that time up front to really invest in understanding what you can do, what you should be doing differently. How can you improve your processes, your systems or your ways of working? What work are you doing that you shouldn't be doing? What can you get rid of? What's being escalated to you that you shouldn't actually be working on? We talked about, and this comes from the book as well, the rules of escalation. So Ariel outlines very specific rules around what should get escalated and what shouldn't get escalated. And you know, the questions that as a manager, you should really be asking. So what is it that you're looking at from me? And the example from America, a lot of times, like, what's the ask? But even going beyond that, thinking about, well, what have you already done? Where are you getting stuck? And what specifically do you need my help with? We talked about when you go through this process and when you put these things in place, you what you end up with is the staff that is more confident, competent and engaged. And it's really about building up people's motivation and their belief in themselves. I wanted to touch on the last point that Ariel made in relation to happiness at work as well. And I didn't want to kind of interrupt her flow, but I'm a huge fan. One of my idols is uh, Gretchen Rubin, who has the podcast Happier. And she talks about happiness as being a habit. And sometimes that that it t- ties in with this idea of the short term pain. Sometimes things that we do in the short term can actually make us a bit unhappier, but it's for the longer term that you know, that that longer term happiness is why we are doing it as well. So definitely something to bear in mind. I really, really love that approach. Stay tuned for next week for another solo podcast episode. And I look forward to chatting with you then. That was another episode of the Happier at Work podcast. I am so glad you tuned in today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I would love to get your thoughts. Head on over to social media to get involved in the conversation. If you enjoy the podcast, I would love if you could rate, review it or share it with a friend. If you want to know more about what I do or how I could help your business, head on over to happieratwork.ie. 